Welcome to NCC Live. Today is going to be an incredible day as we celebrate Jesus. We're going to celebrate that we come alive in him. Any shame, any guilt that we're carrying, we're going to put that aside today and sing out his praises. Come on, would you sing this with me? I was buried. Because I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was not so. Till I met you. Come on, let's sing this together. I was breathing. Cause I was breathing, but not alive. Cause all my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I met you. Come on, let's declare this today. And you called, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. And you called, you called my name. And now your mercy has saved my soul. And now your freedom. Welcome to NCC Live. It is awesome to be here with you today. And there is so much truth in that song that we just sang. Even in those moments when we feel like we are in darkness, God calls us out into something new and something better. And we are so excited to be starting a brand new series called Now What? And maybe you've asked that question. We are going to take a look at what God is calling us to be as we move forward into this life. But before we hear from Pastor David, we would love to get to know you and connect with you. You can fill out a connect card. You can do that from our website, mynw.cc. 
You can also jump on the chat, talk to some of our online hosts, and they would love to help you out and get to know you. And please, let us know if there's something that we can be praying for. Don't hesitate to let us know how we can be lifting you up and encouraging you in this time. Now, later in the service, we're going to have a time of communion and a time of generosity. If you would like to financially help us meet the needs of the community and connect people to Jesus, simply go to our website, click on the link that says Give. And we want nothing more than to help those that need help. And the generosity of the church is really the best way to make that possible. So I just want to say thank you. Keep making a difference as one church in three locations. All right, right now, we're going to join the band, we're going to lift God up, and we're going to thank Him for being so incredibly good to us. All right, church, we invite you to stand and worship with us as we sing this next song about God's goodness. Your goodness is 
song is so true that we're going to sing of the goodness of God. No matter what the situation or circumstance, and Scripture talks about placing our hope, our confidence in Jesus because he's the light and he's going to drive out the darkness in your life. So whatever you're facing today, I just want to invite you as we prepare just to sing and worship of this song, to place that before him. Let's put our confidence, our hope fully in him. Become aware of his presence right here and now. We sing this together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Church, can we sing that together? You are. Because you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's sing together. You are here. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship. He's here. You are here, turning light around I worship you I worship you you are here meant in every heart I worship you I worship you cause you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper Even when I don't, even when I 
Father God, we thank you that you are indeed the way maker, the miracle worker, that you're light in the midst of darkness. And so we're thankful that we can be confident that you never stop working, that even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, that we can have confidence that you are God that still works, even in uncertain times. So Lord, we're thankful for that. Help us now as we Open up your word, God, that we would hear not just with our ears, but with our heart, and God, that we would act on it. We wouldn't just use this for knowledge, but we'd use this for action. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, today we start a brand new series called Now What? And the title comes from a prayer request in Jeremiah 42.3. In this section, the Hebrew people have just been through a tough battle. They feel defeated, beat down, tired. They're overwhelmed. They're feeling like many of us feel in 2020. And so they go to the prophet Jeremiah with this prayer request. Jeremiah, would you, would you just pray that the Lord, your God, will tell us where we should go and what we should do? This is the question that's been on my mind and maybe yours as well. Where do we go? What should we do? In other words, now what? So these words express a prayer that most of us have been praying. It's a prayer of school teachers and administrators facing incredible educational challenges. Now what, God? Tell us where we should go and what we should do. It's the prayer of parents wondering how they're going to continue with distance learning or homeschool school while juggling life. Now what, God? What should we do? It's the prayer of business owners facing challenges they never dreamed of and praying, Lord, tell us where we should go and what we should do. And honestly, it's the prayer of your pastor in these uncertain times. For months I've been praying, where should we go and what should we do? God, now what? Well, there's no better place to go than to God's word and find out. Now, it might be different than we expect. Maybe you heard the story of a man who's jogging and the path passes a cliff and he gets way too close and he falls down. He scrambles, somehow he grabs hold of a branch and he begins to scream, help, help. Is there anyone up there who can help me? So he yells and he yells, but to no avail. He's about to give up when he hears a voice. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm down here. I see you. You do? Well, who are you? I'm the Lord. You mean God? Yes. God, help me, please. I'll do anything, Lord. Tell me what to do. Let go of the branch. What? Let go of the branch. Trust me. Let go. And there's a longer pause. Is there anybody else up there? It's unexpected. It seems like we're barely holding on now. We're living in these uncertain times. And you're going, well, thanks for the insight, David. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I know, come on, duh. A global pandemic, a divided culture and nation, racial injustices and tensions, a contentious election season, a teetering economy, historic winds, wildfires, yeah. Talk about uncertain times. 
In an old play, Green Pastures, an angel returns to heaven after surveying the conditions on the earth. And this is what he says. Lord, everything nailed down is coming loose. That describes our world. Foundations are being shaken. Open up your Bible or your Bible app to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which teaches us what to do. And what are we to do? Be confident. Oh, sure. Be confident in these times. Now, this is not an easy chapter, but if we pay attention, the truths will help us. First, our confidence comes from trusting Christ. It's Christ, not ourselves, that we trust in these uncertain times. Verse 1, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Understand, in the first century, travelers, they would carry letters of recommendation from famous or from important people that would give them credibility. They had no social security numbers, no driver's license, no credit cards. So they carry these recommendation letters to establish that they are trustworthy. And Paul says, I don't need the endorsement of other people to prove to you that I represent Jesus. Your conversion is evidence. I'm legit. My letters of recommendation is your relationship with God. Years and years ago, I received a master's degree from George Fox University. And the degree doesn't mean much to most of you, but I thought it was pretty good, especially for my family. They could now call me master, master David, master dad, master husband. Julie didn't get into it very well. My kids, they downright refused. You see, degrees didn't mean anything to my family. And they know me because of my relationship with them. Some of you, you've known me for years. I either have credibility with you or I don't. You don't judge me by a piece of paper. And Paul's saying, I don't need an endorsement letter to show you that I'm a minister of Jesus. Your changed lives are proof of God at work in my ministry. Go to verse 4. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our confidence, it comes from God. So Paul's confidence isn't in other people's endorsement of his ministry. And please hear this, nor was it in himself. His confidence is in God and what God can do. So in uncertain times, again, trust God. You're not going to hear that from the rest of the world. It teaches that you gain confidence by putting your trust in yourself. We hear a lot about the importance of building our self-esteem. Believe in yourself. Trust your instincts. You can do anything. Anything you set your mind to. You can cope with anything. Now, I get it. We want our children to have reasonable self-confidence. We want them to dream, to believe in their potential. But to tell them you can do anything you want to do is simply not true. If seven foot one, 325 pounds Shaquille O'Neal's mom tells him that he can become a jockey for the Kentucky Derby someday, she's not truthful. His sheer size prohibits this. There's a Christian song that says it this way. I can be anything God wants me to be. And that's the big difference. There are some things we can't resolve on our own, regardless of how much we believe in ourselves. When our health breaks, our spouse has an affair, our company collapses, our house burns, all the self-confidence in the world is not sufficient. Our source of strength better be something more than self. And the Christ follower can live confidently in these uncertain times because we trust Jesus, not ourselves. We trust him for our daily strength. Look at Psalm 27. The psalmist writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe 
in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Trust in yourself, you're going to be disappointed. Trust in friends, they die, they leave you. Trust in money, it can be taken from you. Trust in your reputation, a slanderous lie obliterates it. But trust in God and you are on solid ground. It's like this, a 10-year-old boy, he gets beat up every single day by a 12-year-old bully at the bus stop. So he's afraid every day. But one day, the boy's 200-pound, six-foot-one father takes him to the bus stop. Now this boy has no fear. Why? Because his father is at his side. My friends, God is for us. Paul will write this to Timothy. At my first defense, no one no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And then he says this, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. And I, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. So now to trust in Christ and not ourselves, that's not going to be easy. It's going to require humility. It means we have to swallow our pride, admit our own inadequacy. That is never easy. It's like the cartoon of two cows are grazing by a highway when a tank truck, a tank truck of milk passes by. And in big red letters, it reads, pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, vitamin A, vitamin a added. And the one cow turns to the other, Makes you feel sort of inadequate, doesn't it? And it does. And we don't like to admit it, but that's true for us. We are inadequate. But the paradox is this, that when we humble ourselves, admit it, then we can trust Christ more fully for our adequacy. And the Christian life is full of paradoxes. We die to live, we give to receive. We lose self to find self. Surrender to experience victory. Another paradox, we humble ourselves to be exalted. We admit our inadequacy to be confident, confident in God. So it takes humility to admit that we're not competent to resolve all of life's challenges. Lord, I can't cope with the stress of today. I need your help. So we humbly confess our inadequacy and we put our trust in him. And then he, he comes alongside to reinforce us, to enable us by his Holy Spirit. Paul could then say this, I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. The Christ follower is the one who humbly trusts God for daily strength. And notice it's trust daily. That's essential. In other words, live one day at a time. But what an anxious couple of weeks we've had on top of some anxious months that we've had. And many of us are anxious about the months ahead as well. And so we're crying out, God, now what? What should I do? While we can plan for tomorrow, we can't live for tomorrow until it comes. It's like the sign in the psychiatrist's office. In two days, tomorrow will be yesterday. That is a healthy perspective, especially if we trust God for today. Another way to put it is this. Today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. And remember, Jesus says, trust me with your present. And yet, truthfully, most of us spend so much time regretting the past or so much time worrying about the future that we have no time for today. I'm asking you to make a commitment to make the most of today. Jesus would say in that Sermon on the Mount, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Why? Because God will take care of tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. <clears throat> Living confidently in uncertain times also means this, that we rely on God's grace. God's grace is always sufficient for the day. Here's where Paul points out God's grace. It's God's grace, not the law that we count on when we die. We count on God's grace for salvation. Let's go back to our text, verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
I remember Jerry Seinfeld, he tells about a list of the greatest fears that we have as humans. The fear of death, he said, is number two on that list. Number four, one was fear of speaking in public. And Seinfeld goes on and says, I don't believe that. Because if that's true, that means that a funeral, most people would rather be the corpse than the person giving the eulogy. I don't believe that's true either. Deep down, the fear of death is really actually the number one fear. And it doesn't matter who you are, presidents or construction workers. Deep down, we fear death. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 says people are held in slavery by their fear of death. For the most part, the world's perceptive, that is that when we die, that God will judge us by the law. You've stopped the average person on the street and you ask them, hey, if you die tonight, do you believe you'll go to heaven? And most will say yes, and you ask them why. Well, they say because I'm a good person. So we think that God keeps track of all the good things that we do and then also all the bad things we do. And then he's going to add up those columns and the winning column determines our destiny. This belief system will produce uncertainty because we all have done some bad things. In fact, all of us, we probably had some selfish motives even when we're doing some good things. And if we're honest, most of us admit that we've broken most of the Ten Commandments. So there's uncertainty because we're never sure where that cut line will be. And so many of us, we live in fear of death. We live in fear of judgment. And so Paul comes along and he emphasizes to the Christ follower that we can be confident because we rely on grace, not the law. Go to verse 7. Now if the ministry that that brought death, which was engraved in the letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. He says, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? He's talking about the old covenant relies on our works. The new covenant is all about God's grace. Maybe this might help. A man dies and now he stands before the gates of heaven. Peter's there and says, you have to have a thousand points to enter into God's heaven. So tell me what good things did you do? Well, I was a Boy Scout. I was a good student. I attended Sunday school. Hey, good. That's two points. <laughs> All right, what else? He gulps. Well, I was faithful to my wife. I gave generously. I was honest in business. I, I taught my kids integrity. Oh, very good. Two more points. You still need 996 more points. What else? So now he starts listing everything that he can think of. I obey the traffic laws. I never pulled the tag off mattresses. Good, two more points. You need 994 more to enter. So what else? Finally, in desperation, he just sighs. I can't think of one other thing. I guess I'll just throw myself on the mercy of God. Great. That's what Peter says. That's 994 more points. Come on in. There's only one trouble with that illustration. And that is that you and I can't wait until we die to throw ourselves on God's mercy. We have to do that now. But when you do, he saves you by his grace. Later, Paul would say, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. So we can live confidently in uncertain times. And we do so by trusting Jesus and relying on God's grace, even though we know that we don't deserve it and that we certainly can't earn it. Maybe on a much smaller scale, I remember Julie and I, we were invited out to dinner by another couple early in our marriage. And it was a very, very, very nice restaurant. No, not Burgerville. I mean, even nicer than that. No prices were on the menu. I didn't recognize names for half the food. I mean, it was very nice. It's time for us to leave. And they tell us that they're going to pay. I didn't know the total of the bill yet, but I said, no, I, I want to pay. And they insisted, no, we're paying. And I told him I felt like such a moocher. And he said, don't. Then he adds, besides, you can't afford it. And I found out later how much it was. And he was right. What I've discovered is this. You and I can't afford to pay for our sin. The price is exorbitant. We can't earn our salvation by ever being good enough. Good news, it's already been paid in full by Jesus. We rely on his grace. In a sense, we're all spiritual moochers. So verse 12, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. So we can also be confident in this. 
We can be confident in uncertain times by focusing in on character. It's our character, not our reputations, that bring fulfillment. And again, Paul will use Moses. He says, we're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Remember when Charlton Heston, I mean Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai? His face is glowing because he encounters God. So he puts a veil over his face so they can look at him without squinting or hurting their eyes. His face radiates God's brilliance. But Moses realizes the glory is departing. But he keeps the veil on because he didn't want people to realize his glow is fading. I mean, who wants to follow a leader with diminishing glory? Moses. He likes the reputation of having a shining face. But it's impossible to maintain this image. If all we do is try and maintain an image without developing our character, we're always going to live with uncertainty. Many people, they put their confidence, they put their trust in the world. Confidence based on what people think. So I can be self-assured if I look good, if I make the right impressions. I mean, we get it, right? I mean, society values the young, the beautiful, the vibrant. This is fleeting confidence. Because as we age, and we all do, it decreases those attributes. And all of a sudden, our marketability fades in the world's eyes. And then talk about an uncertain future. We have magazines and TV shows uh, who tell us who is hot and who's not. Whose star is rising and whose star is fading. Actors and actresses, they work very hard to get on top. And then suddenly their popularity fail, fades. In every field, a time comes when your glory fades. You may not have as much influence. It's hard to find a job. Your glory is decreasing. An ex-CEO in his early 70s, he's asked, well, how do you like retirement now? He said, man, I'm having a hard time. Why is that? People don't return my phone calls anymore. The world's glory fades with age. Now, I'm all for staying young and looking good. I mean, you can tell, right? But no comments. All right, but the inevitable reality of life is this, is we get older. In fact, turn to someone in your room or on the chat line, tell them, hey, you're getting older. Find that young person, say, hey, your time's coming. All right. So Paul, he says this, but their minds were made dull for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. If people rely on obedience to the Old Testament moral code, a veil prevents them from seeing love, forgiveness, and the grace of God. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So when we come to Jesus, we now see the gospel is true. What's inside matters more than what's on the outside. Again, humility is needed. I, we could never, never imagine the creator would come to the creation. He would come to earth as a baby, live a perfect life, die an atoning death, and then conquer the grave. But when you and I humbly turn to the Lord and accept this by faith, that veil is taken away. We see clearly, and sometimes we wonder why others can't. There's freedom from fear. Fear of aging, fear of death, freedom from being obsessed with what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is thinking. And we, who with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory, he says, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So only Jesus changes lives from within. Only His transformation results in an increasing glory. If any man is in Christ, Paul would say, he's a new creation. And that change continues over time. The older we become in the Christian life, the more attractive we should become on the inside. Outwardly, we are wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. So that means we become transparent. We're not so concerned about reputation. We're concerned about character, authenticity. We don't wear a veil anymore. We don't pretend. We admit sometimes our spiritual glory fades. Our prayer life isn't always fantastic. Our temper isn't always under control. 
our mind wanders sometimes during the sermon. What? Hard to believe. But no, there are times we're tempted to hide that we're Christ followers because we don't want to offend anybody. But the person, the person who trusts in the Lord is more concerned with God's evaluation than human opinion. They're more concerned about their character than their reputation because reputation always fades. Character endures and intensifies. The bottom line, the more we trust God, the more confident we become. Why? Because our strength for the uncertain, our strength for the stress of the day is not in ourselves, but it's in Christ. Jesus never fails. We don't have to live with uncertainty when we die. Our hope for life after death is not in our good works, but it's in God's grace. Jesus is dependable. We don't have to live with uncertainty of who we are. We don't have to worry about our reputation fading. We're confident in our character deepening with the passing of time. My friends, we trust Jesus. Jesus never fails. And Jesus is dependable. And because Jesus is trustworthy, because he's always there for us, we live confidently, even in, especially in, uncertain times. Most of us have probably read this poem called Footprints. The author of Footprints, Margaret Fishbeck, she went through some very challenging times in her life, times of uncertainty. The person that she loved the most left her. She then caught meningitis. She was bedridden for months. She came to the lowest place of her life. Another man fell in love with her, wants to marry her. She wouldn't marry him. She basically said, I'm out of trust. I'm not sure I trust God. I, I know I don't trust men. I'm just out of trust. Well, one night as she lay in bed, she began to write in her diary. Here's what she wrote. One night a man had a dream, and he dreamed that he was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes of his life. And for each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other belonging to the Lord. And after the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. And he also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and at the very saddest times of his life. This really bothered him. So he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during some of the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. And I don't understand, Lord, why? Why, when I needed you the very most, you would leave me? And the Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. And I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Let's trust in Jesus. Let's hear this as our prayer, and then we'll go to a time of communion. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, for grace. Trust him more. 
Two old hymns come to mind as I think about today's theme, Be Confident in the Lord. The topic has reminded me that my self-confidence doesn't get me very far. But my confidence in the one who, in the words of the first song that comes to mind, gave it all, all to him I owe, has been my strength for a long lifetime. The second hymn asserts, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Jesus' blood, His sacrifice, His death, through which He gave us the hope of life. I can sing because of that cross. We're about to sing a new song, at least new to me. It asserts that power belongs uh, to the one who was and is and is to come. The power is His. The confidence and the hope, they're ours because of Him. Will you pray with me? Lord, as, as, as we break this bread, representing your body, and as we drink from the cup, representing your blood, the body, the blood, shed for us, given for us, that we might have life. Hmm. This reminder gives us confidence. Our hope, our confidence is in you, Lord. Amen. So we take the bread with thanksgiving and we drink of the cup with gratitude. Amen. This is hidden within your glory. Jesus, my strength is in you. The odds are against me, but you are.
some great words from that great song that we have a great God and this is the God that gives us hope. And I want you to go away here today knowing that we have hope because of God, because of His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you sense that you don't have hope, then let's go ahead and connect. Connect with your online pastor right now, or the online host, uh, or you can email us. We can set up some time to get together. It's really important during these uncertain times that we recognize how important it is to be able to be confident because of who God is. Not in ourselves, but we're gonna to continue to trust God. Hoping you're gonna have a great week. Continue to stay connected, and we'll see you next time.